Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And today our ongoing little tutorial series is going to revisit the Victuola's Yard. Now I used this in a previous sponsorship to show how easy it was to set up the method of payment and now we're going to uh, real time it through setting up another book. So you can see I've just gone to add a physical object, I've uploaded a picture and just add the title to the picture. Um, this is, of course, HMS Warspite through the original builder's plans. Doesn't really need a tremendous amount of explanation, but I'm going to put one in there anyway. Uh, penny for the reference, if anyone gets that one. And then check options. So just adds a price. Um, make sure it's fairly reasonable. This is obviously a spare copy that I have. There is only one uh, spare copy, however. And then I can just check the other options, make sure I'm all happy with that. And then I can go to publish and I can schedule. So I'm obviously setting this to launch at a point when this video is live. And it really is that simple. Once you've got it set up, everything's ready to go. And well, it'll be available by the time you're watching it. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. So, SMS Seidlitz, or Seidlitz. Again, I've heard Germans pronounce it both ways. Um, I may slip between the two during the video. I do apologise in advance to whichever of you don't like whichever version I'm using. Anyway, as we all know, at the Battle of Jutland, uh, Seidlitz took one heck of a pounding and just about managed to make it home. But we're going to look at, in a bit more detail at exactly what happened to her and when it happened to her and the effects thereafter that were caused by those various hits. A handful of quick caveats before we start. One is that we're only going to be showing major calibre hits. There were a few hits by lighter shells on Seidlitz, which caused various bits and pieces of damage, but we're not going to cover those because basically they didn't have all that much effect on her stability, water tightness, etc, etc. Secondly, I have converted all the time references in this video to British Standard Time, i.e. the time that was used by the Grand Fleet in the Battle of Jutland, basically for continuity purposes with the main Battle of Jutland video series. Of course, Seidlitz's logs were using German time, uh, which is an hour ahead of British time anyway, plus they were on summer time. So if you read the logs directly, they're in German summer time. If you read them in a number of different books, they're corrected to Central European time. And if you read other accounts, usually combined accounts that are telling the entire battle, they'll be converted yet again to British Standard Time, if it's being written from a British point of view, or sometimes the British uh, records are converted to Central European Time, basically so that you know events like ships blowing up and so forth happen at the same time and don't have a, an hour-long gap between them in the different accounts. But, as I said, since we've already done the three-part series on Jutland using British Standard Time, that's the time I've converted everything into here as well. And thirdly, you'll notice as we go forward that I've used a model of Seidlitz to illustrate the various hits in a bit more detail than can usually be found from looking at overall photos and indeed some of the hits don't seem to have been easily photographed. They are actually photographed if you go into the archives and find them all but um, that can be somewhat difficult since they are stored in the German archives which have some very different use cases compared to British archives. Nonetheless uh, when you're looking at the model, before people start furiously typing away on their keyboards, yes, I'm aware there are three shades of grey on it instead of two. Uh, that's because Tamiya Humbrol colour conversion charts lie. Um, and yes, I am aware that there is an awful lot of detail missing. It's a 1 to 350 scale model. It has a lot of etched brass to go on it. It has a lot of very fiddly plastic bits to go on it and weathering detailing and so forth. Frankly, I did not have the time or the inclination to put all of those on, considering that, you know, given the subject matter of the video, I was about to treat that model with the same due care and attention that a 19th century European politician confronted with a map of Africa and a pen would do. 
and also although the model is a pretty nice one it doesn't actually come with the torpedo nets and booms for them which Sadlitz did actually have at Jutland and you'll hear mentioned in a number of accounts but to be honest even if they it had come with them I wouldn't have put them on because it would have obscured some of the other bits and pieces that you're going to see so yes it is a somewhat incomplete model but the major details are there and correct so you can get a correct idea of what was going on so yeah I apologize for the fact I wasn't able to pull a completely perfect 1 to 350 Sadlitz model but um well I only had a week to build it <laughs> Now with that out of the way, only two other notes. One, of course, is that, as mentioned before, we have actually looked at the Battle of Jutland in its entirety in a previous set of videos, so I'm not going to be rehashing the entire Battle of Jutland, I'm just going to be presenting the key points from Seidlitz's perspective with a few other notations thrown in to give context. And secondly, um, yes, the helmsman of Seidlitz was on a standing on a conviction for drunkenness at the helm uh, when he went into battle and he would receive an iron cross for his services in the battle keeping the ship alive and unfortunately much as it would make a superb story it does seem very likely that he was although convicted of having a problem of repeated drunkenness he was probably entirely sober for the whole encounter albeit if you do want to imagine him as Hector von Barbosa fighting in a maelstrom, um, well, more power to you. And to be perfectly honest, it probably makes the whole thing a lot more entertaining. So go ahead. I know I certainly will be. Now, with all that said, Seidlitz was, of course, part of First Scouting Group and so would be seeing action for most of the battle. At about 25 past two in the afternoon of the 31st of May 1916, the cruiser Frankfurt reported a smoke cloud in its relative northwest and five minutes later first scouting group altered course west southwest to cover the approach of the lighter german forces that were part of their fleet screen at this point they were proceeding at a cruising speed of about 18 knots after a few minutes consideration they decided well this could mean some possible action and so the formation speed was increased to 21 knots and without order acknowledged battle stations were also sounded up ahead, the first shots of the battle were being fired, with SMS Elbing reporting that engagement, and first scouting group steered a direct intercept course, with speed being ramped up gradually to 25 knots. In just under an hour, at about 15.20, things began to escalate as the smoke trails of five large ships were seen on the western horizon. These, of course, were the British battle cruisers. The German ships dropped their speed to allow the formation to firm up and for tactical decisions to be made, with course altered to run parallel to this larger threat. Once the presence of the battle cruisers was confirmed, the order was given fire distribution from the right, which in these circumstances meant that Seidlitz, the third ship in First Scouting Group's battle line, thus directly in the middle here, would engage the third British battle cruiser, which they had discerned was a Lion-type vessel. At 15.35, it was recorded in Seidlitz's log that formation of the enemy line ahead, three lions, tiger, two indefatigables, and behind them at, at a great distance, four Malayas. The latter, of course, were actually the Queen Elizabeths, although it seems that either the Germans are going to subsequently lose track of them entirely, understandable in the battle circumstances, or a slight possibility that's been suggested in one or two sources is that maybe that last sentence was added later. Uh, in fact, Seidlitz's direct opposite number was HMS Queen Mary, with Tiger being the second ship in the line, but you know, close enough for government work. At 1538, speed was dropped yet again as both sides began to jockey for position. Now a relatively pedestrian 15 knots was all that Seidlitz was managing. At 1545, the British ships altered their own course and the range continued to drop, and at around 1550, Seidlitz opened fire with a recorded range at the time of firing of 15,000 metres. Three minutes later, speed was picked back up again to 21 knots, and a minute after that, the secondary battery opened fire at a flotilla of British destroyers that were lurking between the two formations of capital ships. The first artillery officer, Corvetten Capitan Furster, I think, described the opening salvos thus. Immediately after we'd fired our first salvo, I saw on our opponent a fl flash of muzzle fire, and shortly afterwards their first greeting to us arrived. 
And now the battle raged, a deafening noise, the thunder of our gunfire and of the other ships in our line, mixing with the crashes around us from shells bursting in the water. The sea boiled, the surface was troubled by the innumerable splashes of splinters, and now and then the water columns reached turret high, climbing vertically after the detonation of heavy shells. We had quickly caught our opponent, Queen Mary. One salvo over, the next short, and held them in rapid salvo fire. Then, approximately ten minutes after the opening of fire, Habler reported to me by telephone, Turret Caesar is not answering. From the speaking tube of Turret Caesar, smoke is penetrating the artillery central. This was exactly the same report I'd received on January the 24th at the Dogger Bank, also at the beginning of the battle. I therefore knew what this report signified. The cartridges were in flames, and the turret was put out of action. Almost mechanically, I gave the order, Flood Magazine of Turret C. This would put the chamber under water and prevent further incidents. In fact, it was only five minutes after the ship had opened fire that she took her first hit. This came in at 90 degrees, or basically perpendicular, and struck the hull to starboard, as you can see, just below the position of the conning tower and one of the smaller secondary casements. This was a 13.5-inch shell, almost certainly from Queen Mary, and it went through the outer part of the hull into a coal chute and detonated just forward of the casement armour. It also blew a hole about 3 metres by 3 metres in the deck immediately below it and destroyed a bulkhead. All the cabins and the deck officers' mess in the area were destroyed, with casualties amounting to 4 killed and 2 wounded. Initially, there was very little flooding, just some from fire mains that had been broken, but it would become a lot more dangerous later on, as the shell hole also allowed water to get through to the middle gangway in the central control position, as well as through a bulkhead lower down into a boiler room. But that was for the future. In the immediate aftermath, smoke and gas caused by the shell detonation internally meant that the starboard switch room and starboard turbo dynamo room were unserviceable as the gas and smoke filtered down through splinter holes. And later on, the same splinter holes would allow the forward electrical station to short out because of subsequent flooding. But a mere two minutes later, a much more serious hit arrived. Now, for describing the effects of the damaging hits, I'm going to be reading verbatim from German battle cruisers of World War I, their design, construction and operations, because it's basically a near enough perfect summary of what happened. Anyway, so this was another 13.5 inch projectile, and it struck the starboard side of the barbette of turret C, which after the Dogger Bank battle had been nicknamed the Dead Man turret by the crew. It struck about two metres above the battery deck, that's the main deck, near the joint between the two plates, and then detonated whilst it was in the process of penetrating the armour, so early detonation there. A calibre-sized hole, i.e. 13.5 inches, or 0.35 by 0.35 metres, was made in the 230mm thick armour, and an exterior ventilation shaft was destroyed. A hole 1.5 by 1.5 metres was made in the support cylinder of the turret, and a piece of armour and splinters entered the working chamber and ignited the two main and two forward charges that were found there. Turret C and the aft part of the ship were immediately enveloped in a large yellow smoke cloud, and in the working chamber of turret C, i.e. immediately below the actual gun house, the following were destroyed. The right rotary motor and drive of the traversing works, the hand training drive, both hydraulic pumps and accumulators, both hydraulic motors, both cartridge rails and the reloading mechanisms, the upper part of the left lower cartridge hoist, the projectile hoist of the turret, and many other pieces of equipment. Basically, this turret was not moving ever again, until it could get back into a shipyard. All the personnel in the working chamber and the crew of the rotating part of the turret, i.e. the gun house, were killed, and likewise the people in the switch room and the cartridge elevator room further down. The cartridges in the lower elevator were blackened by the flash, but they didn't burn, and the personnel in the shell elevator room were killed, in part by flash coming down the shell elevator, but some, who had their gas masks on, were found dead in the room above, so they had a chance to try and escape, but had been overcome. The men in the shell room waited for the flames to dissipate, and then went and opened the flooding valves uh, for the munitions of turret seas uh, uh, magazines. The flooding was then stopped when it was clear that the fire had been extinguished, but the water was already a metre deep. The turret, for obvious reasons, would remain out of action for the remainder of the battle, but thanks to the measures that had been taken after the catastrophe at Dogger Bank, the 
ultimate disaster of the ship exploding had been averted. Over the next 10 minutes or so, the range closed, but at 16.10, BT ordered the range opened up again, although by Sadelitz's rangefinders, the range only opened back up to about 14 kilometres, which was a kilometre less than it had been when firing had started in the first place. Also at 16.10, another hit is recorded in the log. So this hit was probably actually a short shot, almost certainly again 13.5 inch calibre shell. This actually detonated underwater in the vicinity of the outer part of the hull. The outer hull plates for an 11 metre section were bowed in by the force of the detonation, along with interior frames that obviously were bent as well, and various rivets were sprung and went on interesting brief ping pong missions through the hallways. There was also a starboard wing passage between two separate watertight compartments in this area, and that was filled with water. Five minutes later, the horizon was briefly lit by the detonation of the battlecruiser Indefatigable. But aboard Seidlitz, still heavily engaged with Queen Mary, there was very little time to cheer this observation, as another hit arrived three minutes later at 1618. This was another 13.5 inch projectile, and it hit just between the bulkhead and the casement outer armour, you can see it's at the back of the main casement array, about half a metre above the main deck, and detonated whilst it was penetrating the armour, so again another sh uh, short detonation. Inside the ship, a hole about two square metres in area was made in the main deck, which in this area happened to be just above an outer bunker. The casement armour was also penetrated by various splinters and bits of armour that went into the casement that was right next to the impact that you can see here. Splinters also pierced the splinter bulkhead to the next casement along, and the deck inside the casement. The nearest 150mm or 5.9 inch gun was jammed and shoved physically backwards into the armour, with all the crew aboard that gun actually dying in the explosion, with the exception of what appears to be the ship's chaplain, who, with the aid of his gas mask and having managed to evade any splinters, managed to escape further down the casement array. A water thrown up by the speed of the ship, and showers of spray from the various shots that fell short went into the shot hole and then down into the bunker, which didn't help matters. Portable electric pumps were able to keep track of the water levels in that bunker, so the ship wasn't too badly affected at this point, but the coal conveyor system for the bunker was destroyed, which would have had serious consequences had Sadlitz not been quite so close to home. At this time, Seidlitz was increasing speed to 22 knots, and a general exchange of fire continued until at about 1626, either Der Flinger or Seidlitz scored a hit that sent Queen Mary up in the second great fireball of the day. Without anything left of her original target to shoot at, Seidlitz switched instead to shooting at HMS Tiger. To give you some idea of how the engagement was developing, the first of the Queen Elizabeths had opened up sometime earlier at 8 minutes past 4, and all of them were in action, firing at various targets by 15 minutes past four. But as they progressed up the line, they were only noticed aboard our point of view ship at 1632. Whilst Moltke and von der Tann had occupied most of the 15-inch on ship's attention up to this point, the German battle cruisers could also see the high seas fleet approaching from the other direction at around 1641. And by 1649, the leading German battleships had opened fire. But within 60 seconds of that particular occurrence, another hit had arrived aboard Seidlitz, this time from a 15-inch shell. This one struck quite high up on the bow, and detonated pretty much immediately, resulting in a 1.5 by 1 meter hole blown in the forecastle deck, and a larger hole, about 2 meters by 4 meters, blown in the upper deck, about 3 meters further into the ship from the hole resulting from the penetration. The outer skin of the ship, uh, the outer hull plates that is, uh, was bowed out and various splinters went down through the main deck and through the bulkhead into the next watertight compartment. This explosion also destroyed quite a number of electrical components. Whilst the smoke was still clearing from this, the ship began a wheeling turn to head back the way it had come, with first scouting group now forming a somewhat extended leading formation of the German main battle line. By 1655, this turn was complete, and fire was once again resumed against the British ships, only four torpedo tracks to be noticed, as various British ships had fired their underwater weapons to cover the wheel to the north by their own battleships and battlecruisers. And at 1657, one of these found their mark. 
This blew a hole about 4 meters by 12 meters in the outer hull plating. The internal torpedo bulkhead was bowed in but was not penetrated, although some of the internal frames internal to the torpedo bulkhead were bent out of shape and various rivets were sent pinging around everywhere because of course the bulkhead had crushed those backwards. The starboard 150mm gun, you can see it sitting quite jauntily up there, had the muzzle pushed upwards by a column of water, rather understandably, and became so firmly wedged in its cradle that it couldn't be used anymore. At the same time the gun was also hurled backwards and so it couldn't be turned either. The ingress of water into the watertight compartment that made up this section of the ship caused all the torpedo firing electrical equipment to fail, so torpedo firing could only be accomplished manually if they wanted to do that, using commands coming down from the speaking tubes. The wing passages in the, both the compartment adjacent to where the torpedo struck and the next one along were filled with water, and the outer and protective bunkers in a fairly long line also began to flood. Although, as we said, the torpedo bulkhead was just about holding firm, there was a bit of leakage which shorted out a number of electrical motors and control positions, as well as a little bit of flooding into a connecting corridor. This, when combined with some of the flooding up from one of the first hits, meant that there was a further overall increase in water level in this area. More water began to enter through various speaking tubes and other piercings in the bulkheads, which meant that the spaces that were all below the ship's main armoured deck would now gradually fill with water as time went on. Whilst damage control parties were still trying to work out exactly what the extent of flooding caused by the torpedo hit was, a number of 15-inch shells started arriving on board. At 17.06, a 15-inch shell blew a 2 by 2 meter hole in the upper deck on the port side, then travelled through the ship before detonating just above the upper deck on the starboard side, blowing out one of the smaller 88mm guns, again not modelled here in this particular model, and blowing out a considerably larger 3 meter by 4 meter hole in the forecastle deck and starboard side of the ship. Splinters penetrated quite deep down, including down below the main deck, and this area would cause considerable flooding both now, from water being thrown up by the bow, and later on as the ship's bow sank, considerable amounts of water would be admitted through these two holes, and obviously through the splinter holes, penetrate deeper and deeper into the ship. Another 15-inch shell hit two minutes later at eight minutes past five, hit the forecastle deck a little bit further aft and exploded immediately, so another premature detonation. It did however blow a fairly substantial hole in the forecastle deck, and then directly below that, internal to the ship, a much larger hole was blown into the upper deck, and then splinters continued down through the main deck and into one of the torpedo transport shafts, causing extensive damage and then of course subsequently allowing flooding to spread considerably further down into the ship. And then two minutes after that, at ten minutes past six, another 15-inch shell hit the faceplate of turret B, or Berta, near the right-hand barrel and once again exploded on impact, which meant that there was a lot of white and yellow smoke and gas everywhere, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Nonetheless, the turret faceplate was holed um, by a calibre-sized hole. Splinters were thrown out onto the upper deck, unsurprisingly enough, uh, through the breakwater and then onto the casement rangefinder. A piece of armour, a piece of the gun mantle and a piece of the driving band were all driven into the turret and stuck in the right-hand gun cradle carriage and various bits were also found stuck in the right-hand barrel. Inside the turret, obviously, everybody felt a rather powerful impact. The turret shook quite violently, and the gun crew had to put their gas masks on and try and escape the turret to assemble on the upper deck. After about three minutes, the explosive gases had dissipated and they were able to get back inside the turret, which was still better pet protection than standing around in an open deck environment in the middle of a battle. Surprisingly, there was only actually one casualty. The gun captain of the right-hand gun was fatally wounded. With this last hit came something of a pause in proceedings, as the British battle cruisers were drawing out of range, and the command staff, mindful of what happened to their ammunition stocks at Dogger Bank, began to review their situation. The front turret, A, had 104 shells left. B, the starboard side 
wing turret had 65 shots left. Turret C, the super firing aft turret, was of course out of action. Turret D, the rearmost turret, had 120 shells left. And turret E, that's looping back around the port side wing turret, had 100 shells left. A quarter hour of calm was broken by new orders at 25 minutes past five to engage the Queen Elizabeths, which were by then the only remaining British capital ships in range. With the actual range reading 18,500 metres, Seidlitz opened fire on HMS Warspite, but the light levels had shifted, as Corvette and Capitan Forster noted. After a short pause, we again went to the guns. The lighting had become very unfavourable for us, and the outlines of ships against the gradually darkening heavens were hardly recognisable, and only when they fired could we see the muzzle flashes of their guns, although now the range was beginning to close. Many 380mm shells landed on and around us, and we could hardly fight back, as we couldn't observe them. The heavy shells that struck close behind us in the water showered the ship with mountainous cascades. Time after time I had to send Obermasterosen Langer out of the command position to clean the object lenses of my periscope, and he would climb on top of the conning tower, unconcerned about the whizzing and crashing shells, and for a time at least observation was possible again. Apart from the lighting, the other issue was that Warspite didn't take that kindly to being shot at, nor did any of the other Queen Elizabeths, and soon another series of hits began to arrive in rapid succession. At 1755, no less than three 15-inch shells all arrived, possibly even from the same salvo, all causing fires and flooding. First, a shell hit the port capstan shaft between the head of it and the forecastle deck and detonated, which meant that the capstan head became dislodged and the forecastle deck and upper deck had holes of about 2 metres by 4 metres blown into them. The splinters went through the main deck and through the port side outer hull plating, and all the decks were therefore extensively damaged, which would allow more water to penetrate the spaces of the relevant watertight compartment and the bow capstan room, so water that was penetrating through this hit could spread quite extensively. Next came a hit that struck the upper edge of the 120mm thick armoured belt, so this is the upper strake, and penetrated completely into compartment 15, that's watertight compartment 15, the entrance hole being about 70 by centimeters by 40 centimeters. It seems that this shell didn't actually detonate as they actually found parts of the fuse intact, but that didn't matter too much if you happened to be inside the air at the time. It smashed a big hole in the upper deck and then smashed an even bigger hole in the main deck, about five meters by seven meters internally, and then went through a bulkhead and destroyed that as well, smashed through a transverse deck support, bent the shaft of the lower capstan almost to right angles, and when it finally broke up, more of those fragments penetrated back up through the main deck and then hit the outer skin plates on the starboard side of the ship, piercing through in some parts and in other parts ricocheting back around internally within the ship. So just about a through and through. Water penetrated, obviously, into the hulls, especially the starboard side hull, which was somewhat lower. And as you can imagine, these rather large holes that have been punched through the deck allowed flooding to spread quite extensively through the bow. And now we get to the oddest hit of all, because it actually could be two separate hits, and but damage was caused in both areas, but we don't know which one exactly corresponds to the relevant timestamp in the ship's log. Uh, first of all, you have a shell that was probably a little bit of a short shot that then struck the hull and detonated. This managed to punch through the outer hull plating about half a meter below the armored belt, and the shell was then found lying in a wing passage. There's no further damage, but of course it caused a bit of flooding. This is the lower shot that you can see here. But there's a separate source that indicates that the hit recorded at this time is actually the hit slightly higher up there, just below the casement battery. This hit some 240mm thick armour, but did basically just splinter damage to the torpedo nets that were in the area and the barrels of the nearby casement guns, but no other damage. Given the effects of even short detonating shells, which we've seen, it's more likely the lower hit is actually the main calibre hit, and the upper hit was probably a secondary battery hit of some kind. 
In less than nine minutes following this series of hits, damage control crews reported that flooding forward was now so extensive that the bow had become negatively buoyant and the ship begins to take on a something of a nose-down appearance. This situation would continue to deteriorate both outside and inside the ship as it was making various turns to try and get something out of the visibility issues caused by the setting sun, manoeuvring for a better firing position, which obviously wasn't helped by the fact that as the sun set, which was silhouetting the Germans and hiding the British, light levels overall were going down and there was of course also encroaching smoke and fog. And to cap it all off, one of 3rd Battlecruiser Squadron ships probably scored a hit just aft that made everybody jump at around 1834. This hit struck the belt armour, the full thickness belt armour, and ricocheted forward. It's thought to have been a 12 inch shell, possibly from HMS Indomitable. The armour plate wasn't pierced, but the plate that was hit was actually shoved inboard by about an inch and a half. And the two torpedo net booms and the nets associated with them, again not on this model, were damaged. Some water would enter another one of the outer coal bunkers as a result of the displaced armour bending in the inner hull plating. By 1844, steering had been transferred to the last ditch position in the rudder room itself as vibration from the various hits aft had caused a failure of the rudder drive motor, which meant that all non-direct steering positions were useless. With firing having ceased on account of the fact that nobody could see anything but the low sun and smog through the rangefinders, another ammunition check was done. The forward turret was down to 101 shells, uh, the starboard turret was down to 51 shells, C turret, the super firing aft turret, was of course still completely out of action, the aftmost turret had 110 shells, and the port side wing turret was down to 70 shells. The right-hand side gun in the forward turret also now had a problem with its shell hoist, which was having to be run manually. Shortly after 7 o'clock in the evening, the ship had managed to sort out its course. Unfortunately, that course was now heading east towards the combined British forces, and the darkness and gloom made recognising targets more of an ambition than an actual reality. This was, of course, the start of the infamous Death Ride, buying time for Shear to extract the High Seas Fleet from another encounter with the Grand Fleet. Over the course of the next half hour, whilst admittedly scoring the only hit on the Grand Fleet itself when one of Seidlitz's guns managed to hit HMS Colossus, Seidlitz herself would be hit no less than six times. The first hit, we don't actually know all that much about. We don't even know what calibre projectile it was. All we do know is that the shot landed just a fraction short and detonated underwater almost adjacent to the hull. This bent and distorted the outer hull plating about half a metre to a metre and a half below the lower edge of the belt, uh, warping it. The frames were bent, the rivets were sprung, and there was a bit of leakage and the port side wing passage that connected to watertight compartments in this area was also flooded. The next hit was just above the previous one. Now this, again for modelling reasons, wasn't able to model the torpedo netting, but it almost certainly hit the nets and the net boom and detonated on those. The forward part of the shell then continued through them, impacting the citadel armour itself. Although the armour wasn't fully penetrated, the outer hull plating that was underneath the armour was bowed in by the impact, and of course uh, all the netting and so forth was destroyed as well. Then a hit, again calibre unknown, managed to hit the upper aft searchlight platform and go through the ventilation shaft just below it before flying overboard and then detonating, uh, taking out the starboard upper searchlight with it. This was of course not very threatening to the ship's overall survival capabilities, but it did mean a very slight reduction in night fighting capability if it had come to that. The next hit was almost certainly a 15 inch shell, probably actually hit the water and then deflected back up into the hull. It nonetheless managed to penetrate the outer hull plating, detonating shortly after penetrating, the armoured deck below was quite badly bowed in by the force of the explosion and splinters actually did manage to penetrate it. This destroyed a dressing station and the upper deck and conning tower were showered with splinters coming up for obvious reasons and one man was badly wounded inside the conning tower 
by the splinters and the concussion. Interesting considering the shell had actually hit reasonably far away from that location. Now obviously as the ship was in a fairly nose down position at this point the hit allowed water to flood into the port side outer bunker which wasn't particularly very helpful and it, the water would then spread from there to another bunker. Next up was a 15 inch shell that managed to hit the right hand side barrel of E turret and made obviously a rather deep dent in said barrel with splinters being thrown all around the top of the ship. Uh, the port casement rangefinder was damaged by flying splinters and a few splinters also went through the deck into the port side casement battery that you can just see below the turret there. The right hand side barrel of turret E was quite obviously um, unserviceable, also the carriage that it was in was broken and the carrier for the overall cradle was badly distorted. One man was killed and another was wounded by the splinters but otherwise no other casualties. The muzzle of the nearest casement gun was also damaged by splinters and the barrel of this particular turret, the one that was damaged, is actually still at the Naval Museum at Wilhelmshaven if anyone wants to go and have a look at it. And then to add insult to injury, in came a 12 inch shell which hit the lower edge of the aft armour, the backside armour of turret C, which was of course still pointing the other way since it's hit very early on in the battle. This made a semicircular hole that went obviously back into the turret. A bit of armour and a bunch of splinters from the shell bounced around inside the turret, caused some more damage, found a few charges that hadn't been set on fire yet and set them on fire but the fire was able to be extinguished and everything else had already burnt out so it didn't particularly go anywhere. Obviously with the turret already being out of action it didn't particularly impair Sadlitz's continued combat capabilities from that perspective but more importantly splinters went down and went through the upper deck and severed a bunch of electrical cables for the traverse mechanisms of the two turrets. Again, obviously C turret already out of action, but D turret now had its main traverse mechanism fail, but they had an auxiliary motor, but obviously it was somewhat less capable. But all in all, Sadlitz had survived its death ride, although sporting quite a few new dents, bruises and other marks for its trouble. Having fallen back successfully, Albeit now even lower in the water, Sadlitz's crew were working on shoring up bulkheads and putting out fires when at 1940 Vice Admiral Hipper showed up having been forced to leave SMS Lutzau in search of a somewhat more operational flagship. But when he saw up close what was rapidly becoming of the battle cruiser, he ordered the torpedo boat he was on to keep going and try and find SMS Moltke, which had amongst other things the attraction of having a freeboard that was at least somewhat greater than the diminutive torpedo boat that he was currently on. As darkness was now fully established there would be another break in proceedings while everyone tried to sort out their formations and variously hunt down or escape the enemy as appropriate. Then at 20 past 8 the surviving British battlecruisers found their opposite numbers and opened fire. This resulted in a hit at 24 minutes past 8 and then another two hits at 28 minutes past 8. The first hit of this exchange is the one you can see here that actually hit the casement armour directly. It penetrated the casement armour but in the process the shell either broke up or exploded leaving a slightly larger than average hole of about 80 by 80 centimetres. Various bits of the armour and bits of the shell went through and up and down the casement galleries rendering the nearest 150mm gun unserviceable. The command staff for that gun were killed and the various crew were also mostly killed except for five which were wounded, four badly and one slightly. Later the ship would be so down in the water that seawater would actually come through here and get into boiler room number two's inner bunker, which would cause some problems. In the more immediate if term, two boiler room exhaust fans ended up being stopped due to splinter damage, but these were repaired. Um, parts of boiler room two itself were filled with smoke and various gases from the explosion, and they had to be abandoned for a short period of time. And down in the corresponding engine room, one man was killed and three were injured by smoke, gases, steam that was leaking from a broken pipe and a few splinters, and a number of electrical cables to various secondary guns were also destroyed. 
Then another hit, this one a 12 inch shell, hit the top of turret D, that's the aftmost turret. It ricocheted and then detonated about a meter up in the air, leaving something of a dent in the roof, but although the turret roof armor was dented in and one of the ventilation ducts for the smoke extractors was torn off, which unfortunately also took the arm of a crewman who was nearby with it, uh, there was no other particular damage to turret D and it was able to remain in operation. That was however somewhat made up for by the next hit. This one came in from the port side and struck the forward admiral's bridge and then exploded about a meter further down because it was coming in at quite an angle just above the command bridge. The splinters then continued on out through the command bridge out the starboard side but you'll also notice I put some scoring on the conning tower and that's because a number of splinters also managed to find their way into the vision slits of the conning tower uh, which was also quite badly shaken up by the explosion. Although there was little actual physical damage to the conning tower itself, uh, five men were killed and five were wounded in the explosion, obviously mostly on the various bridges, but this included the navigation officer inside the conning tower, again showing the dangers of this particular installation, even if it hadn't been directly penetrated itself. Also, a couple of searchlights were damaged by splinters. Returning to Corvette and Capitan Forster, he says, On the starboard command bridge, as a result of this last hit, I had a sadder but touching moment. Buried under his dead signal mates and various flags lay the adjutant, Lieutenant Zur Zee Witting. His battle signal notebook and secret signal book key wedged tightly under his arm. During the entire battle, he and his men had stood on the open bridge next to the command position so he could more readily see the signals from the flagship and relay them correctly. The last enemy shell had detonated in the vicinity of this group and had done horrible work to the poor men. They were all killed, except for Witting. I went to help Vitting in his terrible condition and he was placed on a transport hammock. He still held onto his book, although both hands were shredded and his leg was severed. He said to me, take care of the others first. In his helpless situation and despite his agony, he wanted help not for himself, but for the others, his signal personnel. He didn't suspect that his life had been the only one saved from certain death. Two final hits occurred a couple of minutes later. The first one struck roughly where the deck armour and the belt armour were joined together. The upper part of the plate, the upper strake, had a semicircular piece of it broken off. The lower plate had a semicircular dent in it. The shell most likely broke up or detonated outside the armour or on its way through as there were no shell fragments inside the shell hole itself and there wasn't all that much damage to the inner bunker. That was immediately behind it. However, large amounts of water managed to come in through this hole into the bunker in question and through various bulkheads that had been damaged by the shockwave would enter various other bunkers as well. And then the very last hit was a 12 inch shell that came in and struck the belt, penetrated, leaving a approximately double caliber hole in the belt armor and breaking off parts of a nearby plate that was adjacent to the one that had actually been hit. Plate pieces of this armour and parts of the shell were thrown into the outer coal bunker in the area, but for the most part the shell fragments were actually stopped at this point, although once again that particular bunker started to fill with water. This completed the tally of impacts, but the fight for survival had only just begun. Indeed the ship was far from out of danger. The last hit on Lutzau had been significantly earlier than the last hit on Seydlitz, and that ship would founder later in the night. However, unlike her newer compatriot, the largest forward compartment on Seydlitz, the forward torpedo flat, was as yet clear of water. If it stayed that way, there might be hope. But there was still, of course, danger. Like on Lutzau, although the holes in the upper portion of the bow were not a problem if you just looked at the ship in abstract, in the cold, dark reality of that night, the bow was, of course, down significantly, and the large shell holes on the decks were allowing water to enter above the armoured deck because the speed of the ship managed to draw water over the forecastle. 
and then because of the destruction of the interior bulkheads and the various armoured and non-armoured decks by splinters and explosions, the water was able to freely flood the forecastle. Somewhere out there in the darkness, this was exactly the problem that was happening to First Scouting Group's former flagship. A heavy shell hit in compartment 8, which was one of the two parting shots right at the end of the battle, which had hit on the citadel armour just below the aft funnel, allowed an upper bunker to flood, and separately the hole in the armour to uh, the port number 4 150mm casement threatened to become a fairly serious danger, as if water got in there, the entire casement gallery might then flood. That amount of water would in and of itself be bad enough, but combined with the location of the gallery in terms of overall height within the hull and its horizontal position far out on the wing, it was about the worst place for flooding to occur to preserve the ship's stability. Thanks to the flooding in the bow, damage control crews couldn't get close enough to shore up the holes themselves for the most part, and they had to content themselves with making a perimeter of reinforcements at the first continuous line of compartments they could find that hadn't yet been flooded, and then trying to patch or cover over the holes in the ship that were still at least somewhat above water. Unfortunately, much of their damage control equipment was now also kindling or either or underwater, and so what was left meant Improvisation had to be used, and so wooden mats, hammocks, and wooden wedges were all hammered into place, some of which were standard damage control equipment, others were just grabbed from whatever was lying around. But the ad hoc nature of these meant that as the ship sank ever lower into the water, the force of the swell quickly weakened and then washed away even their best efforts. The bow of the ship would continue to sink even deeper, the stern rose ever so slightly, and now the bow was low enough that the bow wave was washing over the forecastle, and water began pouring through all sorts of shell holes there. Uh, from 20 knots, the speed had to be dropped until 12. At 12 knots, the deck wasn't quite a wash. Uh, much like on Titanic, however, Seidlitz's watertight bulkheads only extended up so far, and now internally one of those was overtopped above the forward torpedo flat, with water now threatening to spread to the entire area above the machinery spaces. Incidentally, that meant that the crew of the Ford Torpedo Room were now surrounded on every side, including above and behind them, by seawater. The available pumps within the torpedo compartment could just about cope, but that was about all they could hope for. By morning, speed had dropped down to seven knots to try and prevent catastrophic flooding, and then as it came up to 8 in the morning, the gyro compasses failed, so now Sadlitz had to be accompanied by other ships to help her navigate. Unfortunately, all of her charts were lost, either blown up, damaged, or now underwater in a compartment somewhere. And with the bow so far down, despite their best efforts, the ship grounded in the Aram Channel. In order to free the ship and to get it moving again, paradoxically you actually had to flood the ship more, so extensive parts of the stern were flooded because this brought the overall trim of the ship up, i.e. the bow, relatively speaking, rose. With this and a rising tide, the ship managed to work itself free of the grounding it had incurred and pass through the Amram Passage, but the ship was settling deeper and deeper into the water and gradually going out of control. In all likelihood, she probably would have foundered at this point if it wasn't for the fact that two steamers equipped with pumps, as well as a number of tugs, managed to come alongside at this point. They were able to start pumping out parts of the ship, or at least keep up with some of the flooding, and get the ship pointed in something more vaguely resembling the direction of home. Still, it took all of the 1st of June, and then the early morning of the 2nd of June, before she was actually able to make it to the vicinity of Wilhelmshaven. Over the course of the second, while they waited for high tide, the wounded and basically anything else that could be made portable was taken off to try and lighten the ship. Even still, it grounded in the early afternoon, and then finally, at around midnight on the end of the 2nd of June, she was able to head into the Jade Estuary, now going sideways. Once she was safely in Wilhelmshaven, she actually had to be anchored a little bit away from the docks because the docks didn't have a deep enough draft to let her in, 
Various objects were taken off of her. She was then moved to uh, one of the deeper docks where even more stuff was taken off of her. And then eventually, almost two weeks after the battle, she was able to be moved to a large floating dock from which major repairs could be undertaken. But she had survived and would continue to survive the entirety of World War I, eventually ending up in Scapa Flow along with the rest of the High Seas Fleet and would eventually be scuttled there at the conclusion of the war. Now, just a couple of notes before we go. One, of course, as I mentioned earlier, a fair amount of the information for this video has been taken from Gary Staff's excellent book on German battle cruisers. Link in the description below. Definitely go check that out if at all you can. And separately, if anyone would like this rather now battered, damaged model of Seidlet, complete with all the extra gribblies I wasn't able to put on the ship and all the brass etching plates, etc., so you can do it up to a slightly better standard, but obviously still with the battle damage, then do let me know. Um, if you're in the UK, that would be better, because obviously this thing is going to be slightly fragile up top, um, so shipping within the UK will be somewhat easier. But if you are overseas, then that's not ruling you out entirely i'd still be willing to try and sort something out as long as the shipping isn't too astronomical so yeah if you want one sms sadlets slightly battered and in need of a good touch-up and completion well you know where to write to email in the about section of the channel page or the form submission on the website trickinfl.go.uk again link in the description and with all that thanks very much for listening that's it for this video Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.